Meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Could I please have the roll call from the clerk? Chairman Garvin. Here. Councillor Devereaux. Here. Councillor Gabrielson. Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Here. Councillor Penelope Jordan. Councillor Randall. Here. And Councillor Straw. Here. Thank you. Would you all please join me in rising and pledging allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Start with any reports or correspondence from any councillors. Does anybody have anything they want to report? Councillor Devereaux? I wanted to report that uh, Councillor Garvin and I both attended TEDx at uh, Cape Elizabeth High School. It was a wonderful event. I don't know how many people got to uh, attend it, but it's a biannual event. It was fabulous, very well done, and um, kudos to the school for going to all that work and putting together the event. Any other reports or correspondence? Um, I'll report uh, another activity Council Devereaux and I have been involved in uh, was the ad hoc committee that was put together by the school board, uh, inclusive of community members, parents and non-parents, building administrators, the town manager, uh, facilities director, uh, and other staff um, <clears throat> that was organized to review and make a recommendation to the school board about whether or not um, an item should be should be brought forward uh, in the 20 the 20 slash 21 school budget um, for uh, further review and uh, needs assessment for the three school facilities uh, that committee has wrapped up its work as of last week and the recommendation unanimously of the committee was that um, the school board consider including that in their uh, upcoming budget so um, all of the materials for that, including some good videos, um, discussion, and um, some field photography work that one of the committee members did um, that looked at some neighboring towns, um, some recent renovation or builds that have been done there. Um, uh, all of that material is online. You can find it on the school board's website uh, and I think linked on the town website as well. So uh, any other reports or correspondence? Seeing none, Councilor Straw, the Finance Committee report, please. Thank you. Uh, so in your packets, you will find the appropriation control, the expense distribution, the revenue control, and the uh, revenue distribution covering the various uh, revenue and expense uh, outlays over the last month. Uh, you'll also see the, the key, some of the key fields have been highlighted in the dashboard that's been provided as well. Uh, we'll be talking about the legal services line item later in the meeting. Um, the, one of the others that I would flag would be the fact that um, our overtime numbers are running uh, below budget uh, for the time being. Um, don't count on that remaining as the winter continues on here. And besides that, I think we've now all received a copy of the latest uh, audit report, which we'll be going over at some point in the near future. And with that, I turn it back to the chair. Any questions for Councilor Straw? Um, on that last item, uh, Matt and I were just discussing prior to the meeting, we will be setting up a um, joint workshop with the school board uh, to review the findings of the audit uh, as we do every year. Um, so that'll be something we'll be discussing dates for. Um, if not tonight, then in the near future. Uh, any other questions for Councilor Straw regarding the Finance Committee report? Great, seeing none. Uh, have uh, opportunity for citizens here. Um, to comment on anything not on tonight's agenda. Is there anybody that wishes to speak to um, a topic or item that's not on tonight's agenda? Please come forward to the podium if you do. Seeing none, we'll move along. Uh, Matt, your monthly manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as we're all painfully aware of now, winter is currently underway and our public works crews have been facing some challenging situations with the past two storms primarily because they've been directly during commuting times and have made a bit of a challenge for everybody uh, to get to work as well as to uh, the time of day that they've been starting and they've been some fairly icy conditions. The crew is working hard at maintaining our roadways and we're also anticipating a delivery of our new plow truck that was in last year's budget that towards the beginning of February. So hopefully that'll be coming just in time. 
Uh, we've been requested to host a joint meeting between Cape Elizabeth, South Portland, and Portland for PACS, or Portland Area Comprehensive tra Traffic uh, System, and GPCOG to discuss top priority regional transportation projects that PACS should advance for planning and funding, as well as GPCOG's policy advocacy priorities. So we will be receiving a, a poll from you over the next day or two to try to find a date that I can get a couple, three members from the council who could, who could it's not really a command performance, but if I could get a couple, three uh, hardy volunteers, that would be great, uh, greatly appreciated, uh, as well as meeting with the other two different, ele different towns electeds. Work commenced this morning on cutting of invasive plants at Fort Williams. This is a project that is in collaboration with the Friends of Fort Williams and is anticipated to be all week. We have staff in the park that will be directing people to keep a safe distance from where the work is being performed as this machine is a fairly uh, robust device that is uh, needs a 300 foot radius uh, from the machinery to be safe. That's basically a football field in all directions uh, just because it is going to be thrashing some uh, some of the invasive species about and uh, you do not want to be hit by any of the debris, which will be cleaned up, but it is in our management of the invasive species at the, uh, at the fort. I received a good amount of interest in the finance director position and am reviewing the applications and moving the hiring process forward. And the town received one participant in the pay and display request for proposals. Three entities had shown interest in that project, uh, but one provided a response, which is a fairly comprehensive and a good response that I'm currently reviewing as well. Uh, and we'll be having a recommendation for that uh, going forward. We'll be having a couple of more meetings with the vendor to see and clarify any questions. Uh, Jim and I will be both working on that together. So no, we're looking forward to move that forward. And the ordinance committee shall, it's anticipated they will have their work wrapped up in order for next month's council meeting and that way we can come back with a combined package for the council to consider regarding pay and display at the fort. And finally, the town office will be closed Monday, January 21st, and this is as we observe Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Any questions from Matt? Seeing none. Uh, next item is the review of the draft minutes of the December 10th, 2018 meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Councilor Randall, is there a second? Second. Councilor Straw, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Next item up is a public hearing for the Senior Tax Relief Ordinance. Um, if there is anybody wishing to speak at the public hearing, I will open that now. Please come forward and come to the podium. Uh, give us your name and address uh, and limit your comments to approximately three minutes. Lois Morrow, 20 Ledgewood Lane, and I'm here just to thank the, uh, the Ordinance Committee for working on this and um, you for having the hearing, and I'm glad the town is really thinking about its senior citizens. I guess I am one. I've lived here 50 years, <laughs> and uh, I thought that the ordinance read very well, was very explicit, and um, I think they've done a very good job, and I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Anyone else from the public wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Item number 31-2019 is the Senior Tax Relief Ordinance. Um, our tax assessor, Clint Sweat, is here. I'm going to ask him to come to the podium and just uh, remind us all um, about this initiative before we move forward. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Yeah, I want to thank uh, want to thank Matt and uh, Maureen O'Meara, the town planner, and the ordinance committee for helping helping us craft this uh, this ordinance. It's, it is a good ordinance, and I think it will help a lot of people. Um, I, I'm not going to go over all of it, but I, I'll go over some of the highlights of it. Uh, basically, if you're 65 years of age or older, uh, lived in your home for 10 uh, years or more and are receiving the homestead exemption, uh, and your federally adjusted gross income is $60,000 or less, uh, you may be eligible for uh, a refund on some of your, uh, your property taxes up to $500. So it's a good program. Um, 
And the one thing that I want to stress to people is, um, you know, tell your neighbors, tell your friends, tell your relatives. It's a program, and, and as long as you know there's money in the in the kitty, we can uh, we can keep it going. Um, the applications are. Uh, I put a small stack of applications on the back desk. You can grab those. I'll have them in the assessing office. Um, I'll, I'll need to talk to uh, to our IT person about uh, getting those forms on the website, uh, so you can download them there as well. But uh, you know, if, if you can't get to the town hall, call the call the office. I'll be more than happy to throw some in an envelope and mail them out to you. Um, but definitely. Uh, take advantage of the program, I, I think it'll help a little bit. So, anybody have any questions or? Questions from counselors? Clint, thank you very much for your work on this. Appreciate it. Great, thanks. Um, seeing no further questions, uh, I'll be looking for a motion uh, on this item. Council Caitlin Jordan. Move to approve the ordinance as presented. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Randall, any discussion? Discussion. Councilor Straw. So, um, thank you so much for all your work on it. Thank you to the, the ordinance committee. I think it's a very well drafted ordinance. Um, I'll just keep it short and sweet. Um, I think it's well intended. Uh, I can't support it though while it has um, a re requirement based on uh, duration of residency. So, um, I'll just leave it at that. So, um, but I yet at the same time I agree with the idea behind it. Any other discussion? Um, I'm uh, really appreciative also of the work that the committee did, uh, the ordinance committee, and as I said, uh, the work of the assessor. Um, you know, as we've gone through budget discussions over the last several years, um, you know, there has been a lot of discussion around, you know, the, the widening, uh, sort of gap between uh, folks that are on fixed incomes uh, who have lived in the town for a number of years and, and um, seeing what we can do to reduce the burden that's placed on them. So I'm happy that this is a first step to that. Um, I think that, you know, as we see, you know, what the interest is in this and how it's, um, uh, how it's embraced and, and the number of people that take it up. Um, comments like what uh, Councilor Straw is talking about can certainly be revisited and, um, uh, you know, we can see whether or not it makes sense to remove some of those restrictions um, uh, in future years. But I think this is a great first step and I'm, I'm happy to support it. So, Councilor Randall. Just to briefly reply, and I think um, Councilor Garvin touched on this, but when, when we were discussing the ordinance, the idea was to keep people in their homes. Um, that's sort of where that residency requirement came from, that, that when people have a home, we want them to be able to stay in that home. Councilor Stra? And not to, uh, uh, so um, I would just uh, say, imagine if it instead was a program for food stamps or a program for welfare benefits. And I'll just leave it at that. Any other discussion? Go ahead, Matt. If I may, to the chair. Uh, there is also eligibility for renters in here as well uh, that, that Mr. Sweat uh, did mention, but there, it does not only apply to homeowners, you can also be a renter. So I just want folks to understand that if they qualify, uh, that they should also look into the program as well. Thank you for the clarification. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of approving the ordinance as presented? Opposed? The motion passes. Thank you very much. Next item is number 32-2019, a citizen petition uh, that was received by the town. Petition, petition for enactment of ordinance to limit disposition of shoreline access real estate. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Please come forward to the podium. If we could have your name and address, please. Colette Howe, 17 Highview Road, Cape Elizabeth. Um, representing the uh, uh, 
Kate Elizabeth, Save Our Shoreline Access Coalition. I'm just here tonight to thank you all, and especially Deb Lane and Matt and your support team for your hard work. I mean, it started back in August. I won't get into detail, but it was, uh, I call myself a soldier in an unknown land. Um, but it's been a learning process for everybody, a lesson in civics and charters, etc. And thank you for all your time and effort. We appreciate it. We look forward to the public hearing on the 23rd. And I just want to commend you for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, um, as is outlined in the agenda, um, the town charter is very clear about uh, the necessary steps that need to be taken when we are in receipt of a citizen initiated ordinance such as this. Um, so the recommended action here is to set a public hearing um, pursuant to the charter within 30 days of receipt of the petition. Uh, the recommend, recommended date for the public hearing uh, that we have before us is next Wednesday. January 23rd at 7 p.m. here in the town, the town council chambers. Uh, is there a motion to set that public hearing? So moved. Councilor Randall, is there a second? second. Councilor Devereaux, is there any discussion? Councilor Strzok. Okay, now I'm gonna keep this short and sweet. Um, you're obviously at the public hearing free to make whatever comments or uh, uh, opinions, whatever opinions you want to voice. Uh, one thing I would lo love to hear uh, specifically is I'd like to know um, how would the phrase indirect access be interpreted? So for example, one could say that from here I have indirect access to the ocean. So I'd like to have someone talk to that for me. I'd like to have someone talk to the phrase shoreland areas as opposed to using the term shoreland zone or something like that um, in, in touch to that as well. Then I'm also curious, I'd like to hear people comment on why it's a ordinance as opposed to a charter amendment. And then uh, finally, the fact that if there's a, an expense like over a, a million dollars, currently we have to send that to the voters. Um, I'd be curious why allow five town councilors, we're putting in a super majority, which as a general matter, I view as somewhat undemocratic, um, although I understand the, the, the idea here. Why not instead make it a charter amendment that says, um, anything like this must be passed by the voters as opposed to leaving it for the town council. And to the extent that we agreed instead that a better approach might be a charter amendment requiring anything in the disposition of land within the shoreland zone be sent to the voters, would that be sufficient rather than this ordinance? That's it. Thank you, Councilor Straw. Any other comment at this point? I just have a question. Councilor Jordan. Just to clarify the timeline. We're having the public hearing on this, but it's basically as to whether or not we're going to approve it or send it to a referendum, correct? No. What's so the, the public, public hearing, hearing, we'll hold the public hearing, if, if, if we vote on this now um, as presented, we'll ha have the public hearing on the 23rd, and then at our February meeting is when we would vote on taking the action. Wait, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like the public hearing I'm saying is like because of the way it was presented, it's not like we can drastically edit the, the the language, correct? I mean we can tweak it to make sure it doesn't break any rules or whatever. But but so I'm just saying all the things that you're asking for, all the addressing and all of the all of those clarifications, it doesn't change we can't do anything so, about it, is what I'm I'm just trying to make sure I understand the process. We're gonna hear from people and basically what we're gonna take in is either we push it forward or we push it to a referendum. So correct. Council Straw. So we can't alter the like we can't tweak any. We're we're, we're stuck with this. Got it. Matt. If I may, through the chair, uh, currently uh, I've submitted uh, the, the question to Mike Hill uh, at Monahan Leahy to, to review that, and, and he's had a couple of different, I would say, more clarifying edits that he's working with uh, Nick Bryant, uh, who's the spokesman or the, I guess you could say the council for the SOS group would be the best way to phrase that, um, just on a couple of small points of the question of five councilors versus saying 70% because in the future you could possibly have more council members. So instead of having five, five could be possibly, would not be a super majority anymore. So he's got some of those finer points that he's looking at getting uh, clarified. But ultimately, uh, 
not making any substantive changes from what was brought forward. Um, what we're looking at this evening on this part is there's two steps that are laid out in the charter. The first is once the question has been submitted to the council that within 30 days the council needs to schedule a public hearing. So that's so we have well, the town has until let's say February 2nd to, to hold that public hearing. So that's why date A or the 23rd is being brought forward this evening. After that, uh, the town then has 30 days within which it can set. So that's why it would be on the February agenda. So to me, the second 30 day window to set a date uh, for a referendum or if the council so chooses by charter to accept it, uh, then then you would have that opportunity as well. That could, uh, you know, if the council chooses to accept the ordinance amendments as submitted. And there was discussion with, uh, with Mr. Bryan as to why uh, it was brought forward as an ordinance versus as a as a charter amendment. And I'm, I'm sure I have a feeling that Mr. Bryant will be there next week to explain the differences as to why certain 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 steps were, were chosen versus others. Uh, that may, may, you may find clarification on some of those at, at a public hearing. Councilor Jordan, uh, this is a question probably more for next month, but I want to ask you. I'm thinking of it. What about the timeline? Should we send it to referendum? Is there a timeline requirement for when? The referendum occurs. You just need to set a, set a date. So it doesn't have to happen within the 30 days, but you need to set that, you need to set a date within that second 30 day window. So presumably the council could, if they chose to set a date, they could set it for the same time as the June uh, school budget vote. If, if the council decides not to adopt it, you know, so there you have, but you, but you have to set that date within that. Like 10 second. years from now. Well, just joking. Yeah. Just joking. <laughs> I'm not going to go down that road. <laughs> I was just curious if but there was a, date, a requirement in the yeah. charter. Okay, thank you. Any other, uh, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of setting a public hearing pursuant to Article Three, Section Three. Uh, I'm sorry, Article 8, Section 3 of the Cape Elizabeth Town Charter for Wednesday, January 23rd, 2019 at 7 p.m. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Next item is number 33-2019, Fort Williams Group Use Requests. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on, these, on this uh, agenda item? Seeing none. Uh, we have before us uh, a number of requested uses uh, for Fort Williams uh, and associated dates and the groups requesting. Um, Matt or I see Kathy Raft is here. Uh, either of you wish to speak to this at all? Or? Sure, I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Uh, these are two different dates that were requested uh, towards the end of last year. They've been reviewed by the Fort Williams Park Committee. The first is for the National Troopers Coalition picnic. Uh, I think they were here roughly five years ago and had, had an event at the fort. Uh, and asked to come back again, so they brought their request forward to the park committee. Uh, they both said they recommend approving that request, and that would be on September 12th from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, and as you can see in the agenda, there's two different fees that they'll be paying for that. Uh, the second would be for a walk to cure arthritis, which would be on Sunday, June 2nd, and that would be a 7.30 a.m. setup. Participants would arrive at 11, and that would be at the picnic shelter all day, and that would be, uh, there's a fee for that as well at $700. So these are the two items that we have for requests. Uh, the protocol is that it goes to the park committee first, they'll review it, make a recommendation, and then it comes to the council, and that's that's why we have it on the agenda this evening. And my apologies, I'm staring right at the chairman of the park committee, <laughs> and I should have asked if he had anything he wanted to add to this or not. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Uh, is there a motion, motion to approve the requested group uses? So moved. Just going over. Councillor Straw. Is there a second? Second. Councillor Gabrielson. Any discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Item number 34-2019 is a review of the proposal to construct pedestrian and parking lot improvements within Fort Williams Park. And I will uh, ask first if there's anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item. Seeing none, I will next ask Chairman Carney if you want to come forward and speak to this at all. Or? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm batting a thousand here tonight, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> yep, so Bob Metcalf is here, and I know he's going to um, present detail of the recommendation. I didn't know if you wanted to speak on behalf of the committee, so. 
Would you like me to do an intro on this one? Sure. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as Mr. Metcalf gets set up, uh, as you may recall, uh, back last spring, the council had asked the park committee to come forward with recommendations regarding the management of uh, commercial vehicle traffic, buses and trolleys at the fort. And one of the recommendations was to take uh, to take the buses out of the circle from downloading uh, their their clients at the circle and to take that up back up to the central lot and uh, to try to improve the safety at the circle and other and, and quite frankly traffic flow uh, but in order to do that safely and securely it felt that there was a number of pedestrian improvements that needed to be put into place as well as a, as well as an ongoing management idea of trying to find a, a better way to get traffic to flow through that section of, of the fort as well as uh, address our parking concerns going forward so uh, What we have this evening is, uh, is the fruits, is, is the beginning fruit of that labor. Uh, we reached out uh, through the park committee to Mitchell and Associates and uh, Mr. Metcalf and John Mitchell have both been working on this project. They've met with uh, the park committee as well as myself, Kathy Raftis, uh, Jim Kearney who's here this evening, Bob uh, and, uh, and Bob Malley, our public works director, and Kerry Curtis who's here as well as the park coordinator and uh, reviewed this plan and have come forward with this as an idea for a solution. Um, the idea is to do the work this spring so we can have it in place for this uh, for the coming tourist season, if you will, or the, or the coming season, so folks can uh, can can have a safer experience at the at the fort. And uh, I can pass this to Mr. Metcalf, uh, who can explain more of the details this evening. And uh, thanks for coming out, Bob. Thank you, Matt. For the record, I'm Bob Metcalf of the Associates, and hopefully my voice will last. Caught a cold on Friday afternoon, and <clears throat> I've lost my voice three times today. So. Anyway, uh, as Matt said, you know, we're looking at the uh, improvements for the center parking area uh, down by uh, Portland Headlight. And uh, the summary that I provided to, to Matt to send out to you folks, and basically the, the existing term, the parking area for the buses right now really is very limited to handling about six buses. Okay, with the increased number of buses that have occurred, with the increased number of cruise ships that come in, you know, wound up with buses actually parking into the parking lot where visitors are to expected to be parking. So what we've done is we've looked at the plan. I knew it. Uh, yeah, I tried to do some enlargements. I thought they might be a little bit easier to read than the eight and a half by eleven I said over the back because when I started looking at it, I says I'm not sure I can see it. So uh, essentially what we're doing is uh, of the large turnaround area for the bus right that's existing out there right now, eliminating that and reconfiguring the existing parking area. We're pretty much within the same confines in terms of disturbances, a little additional disturbance that will occur. Uh, and what we're able to do is accommodate for up to 12 buses uh, that would be parked along the perimeter. And then we're able to get the parking fields uh, so that we can actually get some better delineation of the visitor parking. And we've increased the number of handicapped spaces in that lot from two to eight spaces, or an increase of two spaces. Uh, we're looking at changing the circulation for vehicles to help deal with the conflicting uh, traffic patterns between vehicle, vehicle, vehicles and pedestrians. Uh, we're going to be making this entrance only coming in on this end of, into the parking lot. Everybody will come in through buses as well as visitors can exit out one way only. That will help to control some of the congestion because right now that's a two-way entrance coming into that parking lot. So you've got buses and cars going in and out. So that, that'll help to control some of that access going through. Also, because the parking lot is gravel, it's, you, you really can't delineate the number of parking spaces. So it hasn't really been an efficient location for parking vehicles in there. So uh, we'd be looking at paving the parking lot. Uh, as part of that paving program, there'd be an eight foot wide sidewalk that would go along the perimeter of the bus drop off. Uh, we're looking at eight feet primarily because of the volume of people coming and going out of the, from the tour buses and a lot of people with uh, mobility issues, uh, providing a, an adequate space for people to, to move along that travel course. And then along the head of the parking, close to the company's road, be putting a sidewalk in on that side to help direct people down and towards Portland Headlight. Uh, within the uh, 
The parking area, we're also looking at relocating the existing portable toilets that are down closer to headlight and bringing those up into this location here. Uh, part of that is the constant during peak season trying to clean those out and trying to get access with the population that's constantly coming through the park. This puts it not only in an area that's more accessible to be able to clean them, but it also puts it with the largest population in terms of tourists coming in would have access to them. So it, it accommodates two things. It, it gets it out of the way and makes it much more functional for, uh, for service. Um, in terms of accessibility down towards uh, the park itself, uh, we're looking at uh, adding some additional split rail fence along the curb line. Uh, one of the experiences that's been occurring is people coming down the walkway, then cutting across and going across the driveway and actually walking down, uh, uh, I know that, remember, forget the name, Captain Strut Circle. So this way by putting that split rail fence and it really pushes people to stay on the walkway and then we control that space to a tighter crosswalk area where the railing was missing before because we need to have vehicle access into the portables. This way that can be closed off to help control some of the pedestrian circulation at that location. One of the other issues that has occurred out here is with drainage. Right now, the way that gravel parking lot is, everything just sheet flows across the parking lot. Some goes into the grassed areas. A lot of it goes out on the Humphreys Road and then down the Captain Strutt Road and basically winds up going discharge overboard by the parking down by Portland Headlight. Uh, and one of the others is the stone dust pathway when we get a lot of rain events that becomes rather impassable. It uh, just ponds in that area. So we'll be looking at paving that section. And to address the drainage, we're looking at doing a storm drain infrastructure system. We'll be adding a series of catch basins and piping that will capture the water from the parking lot, putting some curb inlets along Humphreys Road to capture uh, runoff coming down the gutter line there, and then discharging back down towards an existing brick manhole that would be replacing, but that ultimately discharges overboard right now. We'll be concentrating that. And then where the uh, parking is by the headlight, we'll be regrading that area, putting a couple of structures in there to capture the water there so that it's not just sheet flowing across and out over the, over the shoreline. So all the storm water will be concentrated into one location. And uh, one of the things the, the committee was very interested in is addressing some water quality. Because right now there is no water quality treatment for what's going across there. So we're looking at installing these filtration units that actually install within the catch basin structures themselves that can help remove some of the contaminants and sediment. So there'll be at least a, a first, first catch of uh, treatment in those devices. So uh, in terms of the landscaping, basically that center island will be a little tighter than it is right now, but that uh, we'll be looking at trying to keep it as low maintenance. Uh, so it'll be grassed and there'll be some ornamental trees that will go along there that we've selected will tolerate the harsh uh, environment that can often come down there. And I swear every time I go out there, it's always cold and windy, so. <laughs> so but anyway, uh, in addition, uh, to address the mobility issues, we're looking at installing an ADA handrail that will go along this section of the walkway, which is a rather steep incline going down, as well as coming back from headlight. So there will be a, a handrail system that will have a lower pipe rail for individuals in either wheelchairs or walkers or what have you, just to give some additional mobility. And then also, because of the distances people walk, we're looking at a series of bench locations throughout, leading from the parking lot down to headlights, so folks that can you know, with ambulatory issues can only go so far, we're giving them respites, if you will, to be able to sit as they're working their way down and back to the park. So, um, I think that's pretty much an overview of the uh, proposed improvements on it. It's really intended to really address the circulation and more efficient use of parking spaces and, and the buses. So if anybody has any questions, we're happy to answer. Thank you very much for the presentation. Are there questions from anyone? Councilor uh, Devereaux. You said basically 12 buses can, can park here? Yes. What happens when we have days with 70 buses? What, where do they go? That part is, I know, through scheduling. You know, we've dealt with Kathy and Carrie in terms of how they schedule the buses with the, uh, with the cruise lines. And I can't talk to the other ones because you've got cruise lines and then you've got uh, Dave 
new visitors that come through. So, so, the, so basically, if there is an overflow, there is going to be an area where the buses can park, and or will they be parking where our cars are going to be parking? Well, they really can't park them in that location. I know they have taken some and put them up in you know, with the playground areas up above. So I think it's coming down to trying to find a way to do better scheduling of the, the buses coming in. So this way. As I said, you only have accommodations for six spaces right now, at best, and we're winding up with 12 in this location, so. Okay. Jim, do you want to speak to that? Yes, well, I'm, 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 Jim, do you mind, do you mind just coming up so everybody can hear too? Yeah. Jim Kearney, I'm uh, on Shore Road. I'm also a member of the Fort Williams Park Committee. So we have not chosen to go to a scheduling system yet, although, Going forward, we ask the operators to try to limit the number of buses that they schedule into the park at any given time. When we get the most heaviest concentration of commercial buses is through the cruise lines and the cruise line operators and their local partners are going to try to work so we don't get into that situation again. So it is a known problem, but with the, new con with the old configuration, it was not ideal to push them into the parking lot. With the new configuration, it will be impossible to push them into the central parking lot. So if that happens, we'll have to come up with another scheme. But, but we, we truly want to avoid having more than 12 buses at any time within the confines of Fort Williams Park. Right, but it sounds like you may not be able to avoid it. Um, I, I'm just concerned because we heard that um, parents were trying to park to watch their kids play soccer and there, were, there was nowhere even for them to park and that's across the road and there were so many buses and uh, so I'm just worried that if we don't have enough bus parking that it's gonna impact residents even more. Have we looked at any other ways to increase bus parking? In well, this? this, I mean, actually we had four spots with overflow for two. This takes it from four to 12 for now. So that's a threefold increase. Whether or not that's enough, we don't know. But, but we physically don't have the space within the confines of central parking, as you can see, yeah. for any more buses. And the team at Mitchell Associates has done a great job to, config, to reconfigure these lots to try to accommodate that number of buses. But at some point, we're going to have to, you know, close the gates to buses. It's we are we are at the point in 2018 where we had issues with overpopulation of passenger vehicles and overpopulation of buses. And there are a couple things that we're trying to do to address that. One of them is this reconfiguration. We also have a new fee structure that we're proposing the council is looking at. Um, and so, and, and then getting in front of the local tour operators to help them or to have them self-regulate the schedules are our three initiatives as we move into 2019. So the answer is no, but we're trying. But no additional bus parking spots. Matt, do you want to add something to that? But we, we can go up uh, above, um, up by where Bite into Main is. We can oftentimes put the additional buses up in there if we need to. That's what we've been doing now. <clears throat> and as Mr. Kearney says, you do have the ability to put in three times as many on this, and there's more order to it. So this, we're hoping that this is going to be a, a much more orderly improvement, I guess, to managing at least the, the flow as they come through. And it should be better for the operators as well. Uh, one other item that we have here is, if you notice at the at the exit part, right now there's a pretty good drop, so buses can nose down and, and the angle's not right for exiting there. So there's a pretty good cut that's taking place there to make that uh, exit from that lot improve so that could, can hopefully improve our, our flow as well. Um, it's not, I mean, it's, it's the best solution we can have at this point in time, we think it'll be a dramatic improvement over what we have as well. Um, quite frankly, to place order in that parking lot will be a huge advantage just because right now it's, you know, it's a wide open gravel lot with the island improvements that are there. There's no real way to structure outside of how, how the day begins can set the tone for how the day ends as far as how parking is organized there. Thank you. What is our, oh, Go ahead. I'm just curious what our timeline is on this. Um, when, when would they begin construction? Yep. 
Bob, if you'd like to. It's a, what we're looking at uh, uh, peripherally, I, I guess, uh, uh, starting we're looking to do it this spring, so we'd like to go out to bid fairly soon uh, to have that and construct and get the early part of the spring construction season and have them in place in time for the. Uh, Bob can answer the kind of the timeline question. That's what we're looking at. In the time frame, excuse me, the time frame <laughs> we're looking at is to put this out to bid the first week in February so that we can get the bids out, turned around, selected, so that we can start with the spring construction and be finished before Memorial Day. Councilor Strong? I, I think Valerie was. Yeah. Councilor Randall? Mine is on different topics, so if uh, you're following. Councilor Strong. Uh, so how many, spot, how many uh, passenger vehicle spots are there now, and how many will it be after the change? I mean, you're going to ask me that now. <laughs> it's less than 100 out there, theoretically, uh, but we wind up with 98 dedicated spaces, eight of which are on the handicapped spaces for passenger vehicle spaces. So only... Uh, 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 You've so, got to remember, we're taking part of that lot to move the buses oh, around. Oh, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. But we're still losing the one, one, two, three... It seems to me we're losing 25% of the parking spots because we're losing the entire... Uh, Far bank. Yeah. Yep. Um, and to the extent we were looking at generating a significant amount of revenue from parking fees, we're in effect giving it up we for We did gain buses. parking spaces by, <coughs> by moving parking down in here, we're able to take a number of parking spaces and move them down to this location here. Got it. Okay. But honestly, I forgot to check the, the number of what the existing spaces are out there, but we did reconfigure it. Yeah, we want to push it back on this edge to get the bike. The bus lane in here and the required 24 foot travel on. So. Go ahead, Matt. I have the answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, we had roughly 88 spaces right now, and we're looking to go to 98 spaces for cars in this. So we're increasing. We're actually, we're actually picking up 10 spaces in this in this lot by 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 breaking it down and Got placing it. order into it. Whereas <coughs> now, because of, because it's so fluid, quite frankly. And then if you do put buses in there without having them organized and with how they need to be set up uh, by actually shaping it and getting the spaces to the width and the dimensions that they need to be uh, and, and reconfiguring some of the islands, we actually hit, pick up 10 spaces in there. Right. Got like three more. Go ahead. Do you want to go? Okay. Go ahead, yeah. Councilor. Um, this may be a question more for Jim, but um, I know when we were talking about increasing the bus fees, one of the points that came up is that passengers might be looking then for a better bathroom situation. And um, since the portable toilets under this plan are going to be moved, I was just wondering if you had talked at all about doing something like composting toilets, something that's more permanent and can be a little bit nicer, um, but doesn't require the plumbing of a full bathroom. Yes, yeah, so we have not addressed that. We have our budget meeting coming up this week, and we know that restroom facilities are going to be a big topic. But that was not part. This is primarily a safety-focused issue, and that's next on kind of the expectations list. So no, not yet. Castro. Uh, so there's that question for: Has the Fort Williams Park Commission reviewed this proposal yet? It's for you. <laughs> yeah, we have reviewed this proposal. We made a couple of very slight modifications, and thought the team here did a great job. Uh, so, and did the park commission then eventually like conclude that you guys support this proposal? I'm just yes, we did. Ah, great. Okay. Fully right. support. Um, Council Gabrielson. I just had a couple of clarifying questions too. Um, so, first of all, I wanted to clarify what the action that we're looking for at council tonight is. Where we would be approving this proposed design so it can go out for RFP. Correct. Is there a cost estimate associated with this design? Go ahead, Matt. If I may, uh, yep. to the chairman, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, we're looking at uh, roughly an estimated four hundred and I think twelve thousand uh, dollars to four hundred and twenty. With an alt, there's an alt add that might be in there. So we're probably looking at four hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars to do the whole project. We do have the funding. Uh, we have two different funds that currently exist. So what I would be looking for from the council is authorization to use funds from the. Fort Williams Park Fund, as well as the Lighthouse uh, uh, Fund, as well, uh, because they're both in in support of trying to, you know, from the Lighthouse side of it, we're looking at basically almost like a 50-50 split between the two funds, which we have enough reserves in both to, to more than adequately fund if they if they share it. I and mean, quite frankly, either one could carry the cost, but 
uh, we feel that it's it's legitimate to use part of the, the lighthouse funds to to help fund this project. And Matt, can you just uh, Reader's Digest version remind everybody the difference between where those two funds are derived and so on? Yeah, uh, the the uh, Fort Williams Park funds come from revenues that are generated at the park uh, through our officers' row rentals, uh, the donation boxes, uh, events that take place when you rent, uh, say, the, um, the picnic shelter and other items that have you know, other items that gener generate revenue for the town. So that, that's the primary nexus of those monies that come in. And then the lighthouse funds are proceeds that come from sales at the, at the lighthouse gift shop. Uh, but those monies are specifically earmarked for, for items that can be spent in support of the lighthouse. And as this is directly above the lighthouse, it's felt that that's a perfectly legitimate use of the funds because the majority of the folks who are parking right there are walking the, you know, hopefully walking in a much safer capacity now or visiting a much safer capacity to get down to the White House, Lighthouse, which is their desired goal. Councilor Randall? Um, I think Councilor Schwab. <laughs> <laughs> we can, of we can go first. Are. Go ahead. I think we're probably right. going in the same direction. Ah, I was going to ask what the balance of those funds are. I have not had, I anticipated that question, <laughs> Councilor Randall. <laughs> uh, let's see. On the uh, Fort Williams Park Fund, we're looking at currently a balance of $793,746. And on the uh, Portland Headlight Fund, we're looking at a balance of $2,247,894. So there's adequate funding in both of, to, to get us where we need to be. Councilor Straw. Uh, so this is for Jim again. Um, uh, if I recall the Fort Williams Master Plan, which admittedly is from 2011, so very, very outdated, and we've talked many times about it needing to be updated. Um, so this deviates somewhat from it, um, but the key aspect I wanted to know if you guys discussed it all is um, the area where the proposed porta potties are going was designated as location for potential future visitors center. Was there any discussion on whether we'll still be able to fit that in with this reconfiguration of the parking lot? Uh, yeah, and that, that issue has come up again as we got ready for this discussion. So um, we, we need to look at what the best configuration for the visitor center is. Does it make sense to move the visitor center up the hill for the summer of 2019 from where it currently is? And so we're weighing that. We oh, felt that oh, oh, this I'm piece of work and that piece of work couldn't wait for the new master plan. We had to get these safety improvements in place sooner than later. So, so I don't mean the um, the, the booth. I mean like a brand new, like a full scale visitor. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Was there any, dis I think the master plan, I could have this wrong, has it uh, kind of walled off as the potential future location being about where the porta potties are going to be placed. Right. Yeah. So if we need to move, remove, get rid of, substitute them for a visitor center, that's all possible because this is just a temporary porta potty. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, with the drainage changes and everything else, I guess this might yeah, be for Mitchell and Associates. From there. Right. So we're not we're not effectively um, put it going all in with our chips, and we've precluded that path in the future. Yeah, none of this work compromises any potential for the visitor center. All right. For a visitor center. Not <laughs> I have a question um, for Jim. I see almost a dozen new bench locations included in this plan, and my recollection is that we have consistent and standing interest in people looking to do memorials and dedications and things like that. Um, would this afford us the opportunity to grant those op grant those options for folks? Or? Yes, we have to work with the town manager and with Bob Malley's office to make sure that we could do that, but that's a high probability that we'd be able to use these new bench installations and the backlog of requests that we have okay. to address that, which would be great. Yep. That was similar to my question. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way that we could even create it as a fundraiser with um, artists or people designing the benches to where it's a fundraiser, or is it something to where the benches are built into this plan and they'll be provided for? Is that something we could deviate? We, we, if I mean, we, we have kind of a standard bench uh, profile that we've been using throughout the whole park that's been consistent. Um, so I think that's been the model that they've gone through going forward. And there have been, yeah, there's been a high level of interest in folks who want to make a donation to have, you know, in honor of or in memory of a, of a loved one. 
so there, there is, there's been that interest, but generally we've had the same type of configuration, so they couldn't be different throughout the park. Uh, if that's something that the council felt that they'd want to change uh, that direction, then it may be something that the park committee could take a look at, but uh, at this point it's been pretty much the same. Uh, any color you like, as long as it's white. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking there's a potential there for, um, to create something really interesting sure. and have it as a fundraiser for this, which um, if we can raise money for it that way, we wouldn't have to use our, our funds. Matt, on the point about the um, the gift shop revenues, is there any was there any consideration given to funding it fully through that, or does that not sort of pass the straight face test here? I looked at it from both both directions. Felt that it would be uh, felt like that was like the most e equal handed, just in case eventually you end up maybe wanting to do a larger project such as visitor center or something along those lines uh, that was the heavier number uh, just felt it was important to have buy-in from both both attributes um, just felt that was the best funding formula at this time I guess my question though is that the the gift shop revenues seem to be growing at a faster pace than than those other. from other sources and so if we were to draw down that more even if it was a two-thirds or three-quarters split um, that, you know, on our current trajectory, those revenues are likely to be replenished more quickly True. than than either the existing revenue streams for the Fort Williams Fund or any potential new revenue streams that we're considering. So, um, you know, my particular point is that when we go over the financial dashboards every month and we continue to see the gift shop sales exceeding forecast, that well, we should do something with that money if that's what it's there for, and our our, our ability to spend it is limited based on um, the parameters <clears throat> set up with the fund. But if this is something that falls within it, then f from my perspective, it's something that we should use the money for. So perfectly, perfectly fine. If if if, if you wanted to make that, uh, if the council wanted to push the ball in that direction, we could be, we could we could go that way too. Well, that's certainly my opinion, but I'd be interested to hear anybody else's. Councilor Randall? I agree with you 100%. Anybody else? I agree, too. Okay. Um, so I don't think we need to decision that right now. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's part of our expected action. If you, if you want to authorize me to go forward with uh, putting this out to RFP, and then we can come back with a... I think uh, let's see what the number is, and then when we vote to approve the... Um, uh, the expenditure, then we can specify what from what accounts. Yep. So, um, so all that being said, are there any other questions? Uh, just three left. Last sure. ones. I apologize. It's just because it's such a huge proposal, yeah. and we're just this. We're effectively workshopping it right here from That's my fine. perspective. Um, number one, have we reached out to the tour bus operators at all to get their input? It reminds me of our very well-intended attempt to provide a second pickleball port, co court where we planned it all out, and then the pickleball people said, "You did it wrong. We we don't want this." So, have we heard from the tour bus people how they feel about this? We got an initial. We got initial input from the tour bus operators this summer when we were in the commercial bus workshop, which is what led to this design. So they contributed information on the flow of buses and how they should move through the cycle. So yes. And uh, second, um, obviously, it's just their opinion. They don't have any uh, veto power or anything. Have we reached out to the Fort Williams Foundation and the Arboretum Group to, uh, with respect to the plantings, and is that something that can still be changed? I know we have a huge plan with respect to plantings in the park and what's proposed are non-native species, and I thought as a general matter, we had some inclination towards native species. So the foundation was present during this review. Um, but we have, we have not talked about what the actual plan things would be or gotten any input. But we could, we could change that as we yeah. go forward. Right. And then last, and it's actually my biggest overall concern here, I imagine it come August, these um, passenger vehicle parking spots are filled with cars, with people taking their kids to play soccer on the soccer field, and we've got these buses zooming through the parking lot, and basically the kids are streaming between all the buses to get up to the soccer field. How do we deal with that? And what happens when a kid get hit, gets hit by a bus? Am, am I, is it an 
Is it, I, I, we've talked so much about safety. Is it unreasonable for me to be concerned about that with this configuration? It's not unreasonable for you to be concerned about that. We did not address the specific issue of what happens if a child were to get hit by a bus. Not to phrase we it that way. We have um, discussed that situation as we do stack up, up here what would be the southwest corner. Um, two things. Number one, a lot of the uh, parents of children playing on those fields up top will tend to park in officer row parking, which is beyond here and yep. out of reach of the buses. So that that's number one, big help. Number two, we also ended up in, in the last B draft of this addressing your very specific question, which is allowing more room at this back to southwest corner and extending an eight foot parking lot there specifically during, so, so that it would be there specifically during times when buses, parents, cars, and players would all get there at the park at the same time. And if you look on the plan, in this local right here, existing is only one small area for people to unload and go up to the fields. We've taken this whole corner, which shows up as a hatch park. That's all going to be striped out as a safety zone so that buses can't encroach in the back. And I said, the size of these buses, they're not going to be whipping through these parking lines. So. And I said three, so I'm going to count this as three prime. Um, so previously, we looked at paving that upper officer row parking lot, and which is why this for 450, I'm, I'd like to see that number. But I thought we had a number of like 300 for the upper parking lot, like the dog walker parking area, not to call it that. but. Um, are we going to see that as the next proposal to pave that to provide more parking for people using the multi-purpose field? So my expectation is that will be a major point of discussion during the next Got it. overhaul of the Fort Williams master plan, but we have not addressed that as, as a specific line item yet. I tend to think that as we get more and more traffic, which seems to be the theme here, we're going to have to look at the configuration of that lot and some of the existing parameters around playground sitting right in the middle of it and things like that, but nothing formal has happened at the committee okay. relative to that parking lot yet. Thank you. Councilor Gaberson. Um, I just have two questions. I think the first one's for you, Jim. Um, one thing I don't see on the plans here um, is uh, pads for pay and display areas. We were just whispering about that <laughs> as you guys were discussing, but um, that's not something that's been approved yet. Uh, adding pads if needed for pay and display is something that we would want to talk to. We'll coordinate uh, with the vendor to get an idea of how many and where they need yeah. to be located. And, and you're comfortable that this design will be able to safely accommodate whatever configuration of pay and display would be consistent? Okay. Much more so than before. I think the addition yeah. of this one way, some of the design mm -hmm. concepts that uh, carry brought in to, you know, add safety also includes the pedestrian flow, which makes that concept even more attractive Thank or you. more viable, I should say. Um, and one last question for me. Um, is there any permitting required for any aspects of this plan? We are in, uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, we, we are in good shape. Uh, we do not need permits for this at this point in time. It's consistent with the original master plan that was approved and uh, we've actually spoken with the code officer because uh, what we have now is currently in what they call impervious surface. So we're just trading one impervious surface for another when we go from from the, uh, from gravel to asphalt. So uh, we're I, I yeah. do need to make a subtle correction. I met with DEP <laughs> oh, yeah, and, the, they, and they told us it was just a, um, a maintenance so then he sent me back an email. There's a PVR we have to fill out. So it's a 14-day permit process just for the changes to the stormwater outfall, but it's not a major review of anything. So, so thank you. Thanks, Bob. Any other questions? <laughs> thank you for the thorough information. Um, seeing no other questions, looking for a motion to um, approve moving forward with this plan as presented specifically for the purpose of um, uh, going out to RFP. Is there a motion? I would move that the uh, council authorize the town manager to move forward with um, an RFP process consistent with this plan. Moved by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Randall, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion passes.
Thank you again. Um, next item on the agenda is number 35-2019, Statement of Policy, Boards and Committees Review of Policy Barring the Appointment of Town Employees from Serving on Standing Boards and Committees. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak to this item? Seeing none, um, I'm going to turn it over to Councillor Straw. He was the one that uh, requested this item on the agenda. Uh, so during the last round uh, of appointments to the appointment committees, we had an applicant who was a uh, town employee of the school board, I believe. Um, and as part of the application process, he was informed the current standing policy is that uh, uh, town or municipal or school, I'm not sure the exact delineation, employees, there's a policy bar generally preventing appointment. Um, uh, I think he disagreed with the policy and requested that, uh, my understanding is he wanted us to re-review it. Um, I understand the benefit of having a bright line policy, but I think our current policy actually isn't a bright line policy. We have a number of exceptions. And I think if what I would like to see done is to send this to workshop where we can talk about making those exceptions more broad based and nuanced so that, because it's hard for me to understand why we would just tell the people that work for the largest employer in the town, which is the school department, that let's say a kindergarten teacher, why can a kindergarten teacher not serve on the Riverside Cemetery Committee? Where's the conflict? So um, I'd like a more nuanced approach, um, and I'd like to send it to a workshop if people are open to it. Thank you, Councilor Straw. So um, I'm hearing your desire to send it to workshop. Um, the other thing, obviously, we could do is send it to the appointments committee to discuss. That would work. Um, did you have any no. preference or opinion between the two? Is there other discussion from the council on this? Or preference between either of those actions? Councilor Gaberson? I, I think I feel more comfortable sending it to workshop for discussion by the whole council um, rather than sending it straight to appointments. I, I'm happy either way. Councilor Jordan? I think if we were going to send it to appointments, we need to send it with a lot of direction that we would need to have a discussion at workshop in order to do that. So I would say if you send it to appointments, it's just going to come back and go to workshop. We might as well go to workshop. Any other discussion? I'll then be looking for a motion to refer this to an upcoming town council workshop. So moved. Councilor Straw, second. That's second. Councilor Devereaux, any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion passes. Next up is uh, item number 36-2019, update on the reuse of the Spurwink School. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none. Um, Matt, do you want to introduce this, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to. Uh, I'd like to recognize Jim Rowe from the Historical Society is, is here this evening as well. Uh, Jim and I have had the opportunity to get together and meet uh, a few different times now uh, to try to move this uh, question forward. We've also had the opportunity to, to meet with Joe Shalat, who's a local architect, uh, to come. We went through the building, uh, did a full examination of from. from mostly from top to bottom of, of the interior. I have noticed that there's a number of improvements that need to take place. Uh, however, the one thing we don't have is uh, the authorization for funding. Mr. Shalat has come back with a proposal to begin the process, which would be to come back with, uh, with plans and specifications, and then to come forward that we would use that to, to then determine what our next steps would be as far as the, the, the cost of what it would be to to renovate the building. Uh, right now, you know, there's such things as insulation would need to be done, uh, interior drywall, windows, uh, interior finishes, things along those lines. But he could come up with a plan after meeting with the Historical Society and myself uh, and try to find out, you know, what would be the best need. So he would ask all the questions, quite frankly, that he needs to ask in order to find out what the improvements that would need to take place within the building. Uh, so what I'm looking for is, uh, well, basically, uh, I won't let you know I'm going to bring this up next month with a funding request after Mr. Shalott comes forward with a, an idea for a cost uh, to get the project started, I guess. Ultimately, I think we're looking at roughly about a $500,000 uh, bill to, to totally renovate the building. Uh, at, that's an estimated number, but I'd like to get a better 
better better feel for that uh, from what we may end up wanting to do. Uh, so, but I wanted to let the council know that's where we were at at, at this present time. Uh, but if uh, and he's going to come back to me, so I'll have it on uh, ready for discussion in February to, to try to get some funds in order to then go to the next step and, and have that ready and tee it up for uh, possible construction season. Or if it, as, as well as have a sharper number so then Jim and I can have, or the town and the historical society can have a uh, discussion as to how we end up getting from, from where we are now to, to fully through the project. Uh, additionally to that, we're also going to need to have um, additional paving uh, installed uh, over by the over by the Sperling School building, and so we may end up. Is that included in with the ballpark number you just threw out, or not? Don't know. The, yeah, my answer. Okay. I guess I, I, I can't say that. I can yeah. speak to that uh, accurately this time. But I but I would like to have our uh, our town's engineer Steve Harding take a look at that as well uh, to see how we could go forward with that. That would also need to go to the planning board for site plan review to have that approved as it is, uh, you know, because the construction of, of new a new parking area within the town center would require us to get to that point as well as you'd have to go through I think site plan review possibly actually I, I don't think so site plan review regarding the building we're okay with it's more for the uh, parking it's more for the parking and then of course you'd have to do building permits and all along, all along those lines but uh, but I just want to let the council know where we're at at this point in time and that you know we're trying to get this moving forward so uh, we can get the project up and up and running at some point in the near future or Go by, by government definition in the near future. Um, so under so the proposal that um, Joe would be coming back with is a, a, a preliminary cost estimate for work that needs to be done. Is there opportunity to align any work? Would it be approved to move forward with other facilities repair going on, potential facilities repair going on in town? The, the, depending upon the cost, uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, uh, that's a good question. What, you know, you know if, if, I'm, if I'm reading uh, the direction you're going in, if, if, say, for instance, the school has been looking at doing some improvements uh, regarding safety and security improvements at Pond Cove and at, the, uh, at the, and at the middle school, if those two projects could go at the same time and if something like that was to go to bond, that would be a good opportunity. You know, you'd want to try to combine those two together, similar to what happened when the, the library bond uh, came forward. And uh, there were school projects that were also wrapped into that. So anytime you, you may be looking at going into a bonding situation, there would be a good opportunity to combine those two. So that's that's definitely in the thought process as well, depending upon what the no overall number, number would be. But mm -hmm. considering that it's all in the contiguous campus, there may be areas that we could do at the same time, or somebody who may want to bid on a similar project, or there, there is, even from funding, that if we consolidated them together at the same time, it could be more cost effective for the town. Right. Any other questions or comments for Matt on this? If I had one Go other. Go ahead, yeah. yep. Um, the question that was raised uh, this morning at, the, at our uh, personal advisory committee was, <clears throat> one of the staff members had asked, if uh, if the town would still own the Sperling Schoolhouse, and the answer to that is yes. You know, it's still a town asset, and that's why I think Mr. Rowe and I have had these conversations about it. You know, and the reason why you look at doing more of a extensive or a comprehensive renovation to the building is it is a town asset, ultimately. And when it is sitting right next to the library, which we have a substantial investment into, if you were going to do it, you'd want to do it appropriately, and you'd want to do it the right way instead of having to do something this year and then five years from now another project, you know, and then and stretch it out like that. So you'd want to tackle it all at once because many of the improvements in there, quite frankly, are at the point that they do need to be refreshed uh, in many different ways. And there are a couple, there are smaller elements within the building uh, that Mr. O and I have talked about, the lift versus having an elevator in there, but that's more of what you would call a tenant improvement. And then we've had also the discussion as far as trying to you know, advance the ball, discussing how the relationship between the town and the historical society would be, I guess you could say, memorialized through a, through a leasing arrangement, long-term leasing arrangement between the town and the, and the historical society. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll look for that on the next month's agenda. Uh, next item is number 37-2019, fund transfer for legal services. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item?
Your name and address and uh, three minutes, please. I'm Jim Mora, 5 Wombeck Road. I support adding funding for Surfside litigation costs. The principles discussed in the settlement proposal public comments on September 10th have not changed. Stay the course, stick with the principles. Continue funding Surfside litigation costs. Thank you very much. Any other members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none. Uh, Matt, can you tell us um, in a little bit more detail about your request here? I would be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. As, as Councilor Straw mentioned earlier this evening, we're at roughly 102% of our legal expenditures for the year. Uh, one, of the, one of the challenges you run into in that is that you cannot uh, overexpend within within a budget area by, by, our, by our rules. Uh, we are at that point right now. Um, we, we haven't overexpended the whole line in that because we have both legal services and audit services within that by, uh, budget line. However, both are gonna be, you know, we'll, we'll definitely spend what we have budgeted for our audited expense. And legal expenses were basically at 102% for this year. What I'm looking to have is, uh, 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 is looking for the council to, uh, authorize a transfer from our unassigned fund balance in the amount of, I, I think we could get through, uh, hopefully through to July 1 with an additional $80,000 uh, from a transfer from unassigned fund balance to there. Uh, right now we have, once I process the current uh, current amounts that I have, we'll, we will blow by our current budgeted amount. Uh, but I think 80 would get us through to the end of the year uh, at least to be the beginning of the next fiscal year. Uh, primarily those expenses are tied to the Paper Street litigation. Uh, we do have other other lawsuits as well that are ongoing. They're not as heavily uh, labor intensive, but they still do add on a monthly, on a monthly basis. And they would be our normal expenses, I guess, or our anticipated expenses. So. Uh, this is this is fairly expensive, but I do agree with Mr. Mora with what he has said. I mean, we are in for a pound at this point in time, and uh, but we do need to we do need to be in in concert with our requirements of the charter uh, that we need to fund that appropriately. So that's that's my best estimate at this point. If we could have an assignment. Can you clarify? Is the request for sixty thousand or eighty thousand? Oh, you, you, you said eighty oh. in your comments, but it's sixty thousand here in the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it should be 80. 80. Yeah. Uh, no problem. Stumble thumb on my part. Sorry no problem. That. <clears throat> so the requested uh, authorization is in the amount of $80,000. Um, is there a motion from councilors? Councilor Randall? I move that the council approve the recommendation of the manager to transfer funds from unassigned surplus to 0135-2010 legal services in the amount of $80,000 to pay for legal costs through the fiscal year ending June 30, 2019. Thank you very much. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Councilor Devereaux, is there any discussion? Just, uh, if we could, just so we have it before us before, what's the size of the undesignated fund roughly at this point? Is it over a million? Uh, no, no. Oh, uh, I thought that was going to be a second. softball <laughs> question. I'm sorry. Uh, well, um, well, we just got updated uh, amounts. Oh, we, yeah, we're, we're, we can handle the $80,000, okay. that's for sure. Um, can I give you an updated number next month on that? We, is it gonna, is it I think we're going to get an updated amount at yeah. Wednesday's workshop. Yeah, we were <laughs> different yeah. Items, so. yeah I, can, I can give yeah. it to you. Uh, we're, over 200000 no, I think we're closer to closer to a million dollars. Oh, okay, but we're over, we have over two hundred thousand in it, so oh, we're using less than half of it. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay. Other discussion or comments? Uh, I I take a minute. Actually, if I can have just a moment, yeah, I have, take I have time. The amount right here. Council Straw, just about three point eight eight six million dollars oh, in outside it's, funds. It's, yeah, I, yeah, I knew it was much more than that, but yeah, I wasn't okay. sure. Yeah, that's why I said we're in good shape. Yeah, about okay. three point eight. But we also have uh, unassigned fund balance 
from the most recently concluded audit as well that would go above that. and beyond that. So Great. We, yeah, we, the 80,000 will be. Uh, We're fine. Won't, won't, won't put us in, okay. we're in barrels. <laughs> okay. Any other comments? All those in favor of the motion on the floor? Thank you. Is there anybody that wishes to speak to anything that was not covered on tonight's agenda? Seeing nothing, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Councilor Jordan, is there a second? Second. Councilor Randall, all in favor? We're adjourned. Thank you very much.